Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Whitman Hanson Regional School Committee meeting of March 20th, 2024. If everyone please would stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we do have uh, members uh, who would help for public comment. We remind you to, uh, there is a time limit for your comments for the public comments. So first is Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you. Should I say who I am again? Yes, please. Elizabeth Dagnall, 316 School Street, Whitman. Um, thank you to the committee for your work all year round, but especially right now. Gross understatement to say that this budgeting stuff is complex, difficult, um, the district is making strides that are beginning to have positive impact on each and every student. And it is imperative to focus on the need for programs like foreign language at the middle school, robotics at the middle school, as well as keeping the interventions that are currently in place in working. Above all, it is crucial to continue to move the district forward, not backward. As a Whitman resident, I'm painfully aware that our financial landscape cannot be repaired overnight. Nor can townwide budgeting shortfalls be repaired solely by cutting education or pushing the narrative that investing in our students is problematic while all other spending is justified. Please put forth a budget that continues to move the district onward in providing sound educational facilities and programs. Please know that there are parents beyond just myself who support you, who support a budget that does not cut current programs and that continues to move the school district forward. We also do not support the terminology of a school override at a town meeting to fix a problem that is not only residing within the school district. Thank you again for your work, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, Justin, <clears throat> you're up next. Thank you. Uh, Justin Evans, 57 Candlewick Lane, Whitman. Um, <clears throat> we met last year, uh, all three boards, the school committee, Whitman Board of Selectmen, and Hanson Select Board, to uh, talk about using one-time money to balance last year's budget and agreed to do something different this year. Um, and I think that you have. Uh, so far, I know that the superintendent has met with each town administrator multiple times going back to July, I think. Um, <clears throat> and I think those have been fairly productive meetings. We've had some back and forth dialogue on where the budget's at. I did also say at your budget hearing a couple of weeks ago that Whitman's projecting about $1.2 million in new revenue. What I don't think I said was that if you assess anything above that number, the FinCom has to balance the budget. We have to present a balanced budget to town meeting for the town to vote on, which means that the FinCom's budget will show cuts to other departments. If we only have $1.2 in new revenue and the assessment from the schools comes in above that, every other department has to get cut to meet that projection. Um, in that scenario, in all likelihood, I think the selectmen, I, assuming now, but I think the selectmen would <coughs> present an alternative budget alongside that would show a different number for the schools. And if that happens, um, likely want to work with you to present an override that would make up that difference. But we're on a time crunch. So the process to put an override forward to the towns, the selectmen will have to vote 35 days before a town election. That deadline is April 12th. So we have about three weeks to decide if we're going to have an override on the ballot. Um, to avoid an override and live within the increases of you know Prop 2.5, it's going to take cuts from everyone, I think including Hanson's town government as well. Um, so the choice before you guys tonight is if you think you can live with those cuts, assess a number you know closer to the 5% that the towns have both said that they can deal with. Um, if you can't live with those cuts, assess a budget higher than that, but let's set a meeting very soon between the three boards to 
work out a plan to, to fund it, likely with an override. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Sean? Good evening. Uh, Sean Kane, 31 Forest Street. Um, Mr. Farrell used the phrase moral imperative last meeting to describe the reasoning behind the use of one-time fun one -time funds. And I agree with him. I am in the classroom and I do know what it's like to work with kids who struggle through the pandemic. And to be honest, a number of my students actually, parents of theirs have died because of the opioid epidemic. Um, a couple, actually both have died because of the opioid e epidemic. So the moral reasoning behind these funds is sound. I agree. But the question I'd ask you to consider tonight is how to raise those funds. In my opinion, um, in line with Justin, I'd like you to consider, in my opinion, sorry, the best way to do that is to work with the leadership of both towns to coordinate an override for anything above a 5% assessment. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sean. Okay, that's it for public comments then. Uh, next is new business, uh, Student Opportunity Act. Uh, George? No, let's go to Elizabeth. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Hi, everybody. I'm sorry. My name, no, that's fine, Beth. My name is Dipna Thomas. I'm the Executive Director of Pilgrim Mary Collaborative. And Whitman Hansen has been a longstanding member of our collaborative. Stephen Boyce is wonderful to work with. He represents Whitman Hansen at all of our board meetings. Uh, many of your students attend Pilgrim Area Collaborative in terms of receiving special education services for one reason or another. Um, tonight, I am basically asking for approval of continuation of your membership um, of Pilgrim Area Collaborative and the approval of the collaborative agreement that you received. And the best part is it costs no money. <laughs> so that's a great way considering it's budget night. <laughs> So any questions, did you get to read the collaborative agreement? We have 10 member districts. Um, we offer home services, day program. We are run all year long based on the needs of the students that come to us. Um, we do a lot of professional development, program development, so we're in and out of districts all the time. And again, Stephen is a key person. He's been long-standing committee member um, for a very long time, and he um, has has the history of Pilgrim Mary Collaborative, which is always nice. I've been at Pilgrim Mary Collaborative for a little over five years now, and it's just nice having people that know all of the history. Um, and he serves on every committee, budget, finance. I think we all know Stephen loves the Bruins, loves cats, <laughs> loves his family, and it's just, it's wonderful. So anyways, I'm asking for a motion, but really Stephen's asking for a motion if you would support um, continuation of the membership with Pilgrim Area Collaborative and also the Collaborative Agreement. Is that a motion, Mr. Boyce? So moved. <laughs> All right. Who is motioning? Uh, Mr. Boyce. Steve. Okay, who's second? Second. second? second. Okay. Any other questions? Any other discussion? All in favor, please? Okay, it's unanimous. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Thank and you. Beth, if you want to sign yeah. that, I can take it with me yeah. and we all set. Dipna is my favorite educator. I thought, I thought Nikki was. Don't you get upset with me. Vicky? Yeah. We'll talk later. You're welcome. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't. Oh, there's no worries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I saw you smiling, Mr. Scriven. I saw you smiling. That's what I want. You really am. All right, folks, so tonight, uh, like we discussed last week, I'm presenting the Student Opportunity Act for Whitman Hanson Regional School District. This is an act that is passed, it goes into, it goes, puts out through DESE, and we have to uh, do certain things with it. I do believe, I want to let you all know that everything I'm presenting, we know there's nothing new. At this current time, there's no budgetary impact because it falls through with what it is we've already been doing and I present, and we presented last week. I'm presenting it in this fashion because it has to go into the portal at DESE, which is extremely cumbersome and it would not be something that I could easily share with you and that. So this is why I took all the information, all the subtitles, all the headings, and this is why I'm doing what we're doing. If I can do this right, probably turn it on. If I was perfect like Mr. Kane, I would have had 
<laughs> there we go. So the district plan summary. The plan for the district is that we will focus on five student groups as well as our lowest performing student list as described by Desi. And I'll name those groups next slide. Whitman Hansel will continue to monitor all of our students, but we will pay particular attention to the identified students that we have chosen as part of our plan. We are committed to our diagnostic paths, high quality instructional materials, our wind blocks, and also the social emotional health of all of our students. The goal is for all Whitman Hansen students to achieve their ability and become responsible young adults. What you see on the next page and what the SOA makes you do is you have to choose certain groups that you're going to focus on and then I'm also giving you some of the data that we've looked at in order to analyze those groups. So the selected groups we've looked at are five. There are approximately up to 12 groups you can choose from. We are choosing students with disabilities. We are choosing our African American and black student population, our Hispanic or Latino population, our English learners, and our low income. I also think it's important to note that some of these groups are part of other groups. For example, you could have a low income Hispanic student, that's two groups. You could have a student with disability who's Hispanic and also is low income, that would be three groups. So we're trying to get a wide swath of our student body in what we want to do and what we want to put forth for improvement. What we've analyzed to come up with our measures, we've analyzed our diagnostics, what you all learned about last week and can continually hear about. We've talked about MCAS and the growth percentiles of our students. We've talked about the accountability targets from DESI. So DESI is making us fill out a form and DESI is making us follow their pattern. So there's not a lot of individual choice in all of this. We're also looking at the percentage of chronic absenteeism, percentage of chronic out of school suspensions, and the percentage of five year graduation rates. A sample of some of the data that we've looked at is on the next page and I will screw this up more. Um, a sample is what's called a district heat map. District heat map is just one of the things we look at, but it takes a cross section of the student groups we're talking about and you get to analyze where our students are and where we need to move forward. Basically, if you look at this, it's an example, but everything in deep maroon would be an area of concern that we have to look at. So our deep maroons, in this sense, guided us. Then we also cross-referenced that with what we know in our district based on our diagnostics, and we came up with the groups that we're trying to target. The question then becomes is what are we doing especially for them? Well, the goal would be to have three-year targets for improving their achievement according to DESA. DESI has given us the targets, and they've also given us our lower performing, lowest performing student groups. By definition, and by the way the SOA is written, we have to follow that, and we have to raise those targets. Basically, the way we're raising those targets is continue to look at what it is we're doing now, and I'll give you some examples on the next slide of how we're doing that. Continue with everything that we're doing, monitoring these students, and then putting in additional layers of support, or scaffolding, if you would, um, so that we can follow. DESI gives you, you have to do it for three years. They say you can do it for three additional years. At this point in time, we're only choosing the three years. The reason why is that in the 30 years I've been in education, six years is a really long time in the state of education. So we're focusing on the first initial three and trying to move forward. I did not provide you with our lowest groups and those students because I didn't fair, it wasn't fair to them to share all that information but we do have the list of students that we're looking at and they are representative of the five groups that we are also looking at. So we know we're on solid ground and a solid path to move forward. If you look at family stakeholder engagement, these are the ways in which we check, see, talk to, and uh, engage with the community and we've done that through these groups. However, I did pull the school committee hot spotlights because I wanted to let you folks know that the ability that we do that now is actually something that garners quite a bit of joy, not only for the kids that come here and get to present and what it does for them to learn how to public speak, to learn how to get over their nerves, to learn how to interact with adults, to learn how to be on cable TV, but it, what it also does, it highlights the fact that we are here for students. And everything we do should be about the students. So that's why I wanted to highlight the students in this class. But there's a lot of people who tell me, hey, that's pretty good for what, I mean, of the maybe seven that watch school committee, but like four of those I've run into and they say how great it is that you actually do that and highlight what kids do.
do in there um, in the schools. Thank you. The next one is examples of evidence-based programs we're using to address disparities and outcomes. Every title that I give you on the slide is a title of a section of the SOA. But we do have, and we continue to have, high quality instructional materials, HQIM by DESI. We have our iReady math programs in K-8. to We have our iReady math and reading diagnostics in K-8, to which we talked about last week. We use Houghton Mifflin into reading for K-5. to We use, um, this year, for next year, excuse me, coming in, we're actually going to look at the Melrose Social Studies curriculum for K-5. to And we're going to bring that in very, very slowly, but Melrose is actually the only town's curriculum, there's one other pay one, but it's the only town's curriculum that Desi has said that's applicable, that schools can use if they want, because it's got their seal of approval. So a lot of people using it, one of the reasons why is because it is free at this point in time. So we're going to look at that and how we're going to in do that next year is that we're going to do, we're going to ask people to supplement one of the topics they talk about in social studies at the elementary school and then try this piece to cover that topic, see how it goes and see where we can go from there. Very small steps we're going to take with that. Um, we also use Houghton Mifflin for interreading for grades 5 to 8. And again, we talked about last week, Kendall Hunt's illustrative math for algebra 1, 2, and geometry. Other evidence-based things that we use to help all students, because we're going now from the pre-K to the K to the 18 to 22-year-old students also, we use what's called Sonday. Sonday is special ed and small group instruction for phonics. We use Hegarty. We use Hegarty in our kindergarten classes, which is another phonics-based program to start the foundations of reading, but that is a whole class option. We use what's UFLY. UFLY came out of the University of Florida Institute, and it's actually hosted by, not hosted, but the developer of it, and the largest person who uh, invested in it was James Patterson, the author. So that is now research-based, and we piloted that at the end of last year, and we instituted it this year. And we also use Lexia, Power, Lexia which, is a on, which is an online program for Power Up and Core 5 to improve reading skills for all ages. We're also doing a few different things that tie in the youth through high school. We have three evidence-based programs that we're happy with and responsible with and we're going to move forward with. This year we had a culturally responsive structural review at the high school. We brought in Dr. Colin Rose. We've been working with him for two years. We've had PD, we've had training, and we've looked at the structures in place to say, do they benefit all students? Not do they benefit a majority of the students, but do they benefit all? We did this through DESE, and next year that structural review is going to happen at every single school. The goal of that is to bring about change. One of the biggest changes we had is looking not only at the discipline handbook, but is now looking at the wind block in the high school because that came from that. Also talks about student voice. We've tried to have an increase in student voice. Next year, we're going to do that for the whole district. Another thing we did, we have a high school stat team review process to mirror what the other schools have done. The stat team is called the student um, assistance team student teacher assistance team and what that does is that they take a look at students who people feel may be in need they try to come up with solutions to help them incremental pieces that could be social emotional that could be academic that could be home life that could be domestic issues whatever the issue is and we try to move forward with that the reason why the high school is up next year is because we've done it with seaside consultants consultants and dr kevin hutchinson already at the elementary in the middle so the last outgrowth is the high school so the high school started our structural review, we're moving back down in that way. And then for the stat team process, we're moving up with the high school for that next year. And the last one is what we touched upon last week is to help our scores in math. You saw our math, there was a lot of red. And that could be because kids don't disengage, that could be because we have IXL and it's not the best for ninth and 10th grade. But we're also involved in the Instructional Leadership Institute through DESE. And this year we're also involved in their next phase of that, which is the Instructional Prioritization Institute through DESE, which basically you get around with a bunch of people way smarter than me, probably smarter than Nikki, I guess. Uh, we bring a group, and then what we do is we try to make sure we focus on our priorities. So making this part of the SOA is how do we improve math for not only all students at Whitman Hanson, especially for those five marginalized groups that are suffering that we showed you on the second slide. The last thing that we'll talk about C and E is that I would like this group to motion to approve the SOA because that's one of the things we need to do. And then I actually have to make sure I can physically load it and it passes all the tests of GEMS so I can get it in there by the first rate. Thanks. I'll make the motion that we 
uh, approve this unfunded mandate <laughs> of the Student Opportunity Act as presented. I second that. Okay. Comments? Questions? John? Um, can you sort of clarify the connection that of this requirement to the actual Student Opportunity Act legislation and as it's connected to Chapter 70 and how, the, how they're related? Probably um, not. Okay. But I can, I can tell you what I'm supposed to do. Uh, <laughs> okay. This is, uh, yeah. So the Student Opportunity Act is, is in its second version. So the first one was three years ago. That was tied to Chapter 70, and every school had to do it. Every school in the Commonwealth did it. Charter schools did it. They all did it. It was supposed to be tied to Chapter 70, saying, if they, I think, if they identified the needs that you have, you may, in fact, receive more Chapter 70 money. At that time, if, I, if my memory serves, um, because we were in held harmless at such a large rate, we never qualified to receive more Chapter 70 money. However, we still did the same thing. And that's what brought in some of these evidence-based research things that we did. That was like the inception, that was the impetus from a post-COVID world in order to begin our interventions and things of that nature. This next rendition is three years later. This will go from 24 to 27. They say that it's still supposed to do the same thing and that there are districts and towns that receive hundreds of thousands, some that receive none, some that receive millions. The issue with that might be, as I've heard, is that sometimes that monetary number changes every year. So I know there's some local towns that receive a couple million or a couple hundred thousand, and then this year they receive none. But I know it is supposed to be tied to funding. Mm -hmm. I just, it wasn't necessary, it has not necessarily shown up in excess funding or extra funding in the Whitman Hanson Regional School District since its inception. So, okay, thank you for clarifying. Um, and I, you're certainly right on track, and I'm glad that we're talking about this, and I think it doesn't get enough attention and talk about the Student Opportunity Act when it was passed in 2019, because um, it was a six-year phase in, so that's the three and three years that you're talking about, and, and this is the fourth of six years. Um, I was on a learning lunch webinar with MASC last Friday. It's free and open to anyone to, again, talk about the Student Opportunity Act. Um, and it reinforces that it was designed to increase the foundation budget mm -hmm. connected to Chapter 70. And that's driven by enrollment. Um, and, and they stress that the intent of the law for the Student Opportunity Act is being fulfilled. So yes, um, depending on your enrollment mm -hmm. and depending on other factors within your district of low-income students and English language learners, that um, you can be receiving more aid. And I just wanted to sort of refer back to our budget booklet um, on the Hold Harmless page because we, we are identifying it. Um, you know, we've seen that the chart goes dra down dramatically and that's because the Student Opportunity Act is working. Um, if, if we look at the actual numbers, we were Hold Harmless of 4.3 million in FY23 and then in one year we went down to 500,000 in Hold Harmless. So the Student Opportunity Act applied $4,000 more, uh, I'm sorry, $4 million more in state aid to Whitman Hanson. But because we had already been in Hold Harmless, we didn't see any dollars in the checkbook, but it's working. And there's two more years of implementation, which means they keep raising the rates of the costs of education so that we can realize that. So enrollment is just extremely key in, in one of those determining factors. Um, also, one of the drivers of that is the inflation rate. Um, and there's a lot of talk right now about advocating with your legislature, um, and we can all do this, or a superintendent can do this if he's the liaison with the legislature, um, because the co-executive director of MASS testified about requesting an additional 2.58% to the inflation factor of the Chapter 70 foundation budget formula, and, and that could get us closer to more aid. Thank you. Glenn? Um, have other towns done this? Yeah, other every towns town has. Yeah. Have we done it? This will be the first? This will no, be this will be the second three-year. Second three-year, three okay. So we did it three years ago. Other like, people who were working for us at that time yeah. uh, put it together. Okay, and, it, and you've seen these numbers go up? Yeah, the, all these, okay. these numbers have gone up, but there is still is work to do. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, our EO, our, the dropout rate yeah. for low income is three times higher than all students. 
Yeah. Correct. And and then and the, two, uh, the dropout rate, I believe, is 29 point, uh, excuse me, the low income rate is 29.2, I believe. And as a result, that that does play a role. So one of these things that you have to do now is actually sort of take apart and get into the high school and the reasons why so that that's part of the structural review that we're doing so that we can say, do all students, every student of every group, get what they need and try to work towards that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Who else? Who else? Okay, could I have a motion then? You have one. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I do have one. Oh, it's so long. Could I have a vote? And uh, does it need to be? Just, it can be just regular. Just regular, yeah. yeah. Okay, all in favor, please. Okay, unanimous. Thank you. Thanks, yes, George. Thank you, George. Okay. All right, next up is the calendar. So we did make that uh, change and put that half day on. Um, early release day on September 3rd, uh, instead of Friday, August 30th, to help the town of Hanson out as a half day because it is a municipal election. Uh, we will keep the kids separate from the gym that day at Hanson Middle School. That, that election does not affect anybody else in the district at that point. Hanson Middle will dismiss at normal dismissal time at, I think, 11 o'clock. Motion to approve the calendar as presented. Second. Any questions? Commissioners, deletions, no, no. yes, I have a question. Yep. Did um, the Hanson Town Clerk ask to not have school that day? Correct. I just, the last time we did this, we had a ton of very angry parents. Um, I think it's a huge, I know you guys already talked about this, but I think it's a huge security risk. I know that you say you can keep things separate, but I'm going to have two kids at that school, and it makes me very nervous that there are going to be people in and out of that building because anybody can go in. When I went and voted, I, I don't, I'm sure there was a police officer there, but I don't recall seeing them. Um, I, 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 I worry about the backlash we're going to receive by doing this. And I know that it's a handsome thing. I know that we voted the schools. I get that completely. Um, I just, our, our, our past uh, incidents give me pause about this. Noted. I mean, I, I, I'm looking at the calendar and that's the day that I mean we can extend the school year um, but that's problematic and I'm, I don't think we as a district want to separate one school and, and close one school so Ms. Bright? Uh, Beth, sorry no I, I just had, recognized Bright. Yeah I had my hand raised. Oh I'm sorry. Where, you did touch base with public safety. Yeah, we will have well. officers there mm -hmm. yeah I mean, and what we are are doing one more thing is is closing that gate between the gym. Yeah. So I mean, auditorium too. Uh, everything on that side of the building would be off limits for for kids that day for that half day. Okay. Don. Um, December twenty third on the calendar. I don't have it in front of me because it was from last week. That's a no school day. It's a contractual no school day in the teacher's contract. If it falls on a Monday or Tuesday, December twenty third is a day off. Okay. Fair enough. So, so we looked at that day as well. <laughs> What's that? I said we looked at that day when we okay. ran across this. Fighting about okay. that day for 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> then, um, no, 22nd. Yeah, yeah if we was. went through this before and there's uncertainty about access to the school on that day, then it may make sense to move the last day of school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just, I don't know. I, I just know I was on the receiving end of emails and conversations at the fields because I live there and being in a myself I, I it, it makes me nervous significantly that's all yes. um, I from Hanson as well and I received most comments about anything from anything to do with school committee about that subject mm -hmm. from parents honestly the same thing just safety concerns about their kids um, so I'm second I can't really say. Mm -hmm. so I know it's a, it's tough all around mm -hmm. but there, there are great concerns. So I don't know if that just means more police officers or I don't yeah. know what that means or how it's going to land. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. I just want clarification. So September 3rd is an election day. Mm -hmm. Correct. At all schools, a couple no. of schools, one school. Hanson Middle School. Hanson Middle School. Yeah, so that's where they vote. Where they I get, vote. Yep, I know yeah. that. I'm just. Whitman votes at the town hall. But then the November election is a. We closed everything because it's an election day. We expect. Heavy is they voting at all schools? Or just no, they're the just school? voting at the middle school, but we expect. Why is it different? Heavy, heavy traffic mm -hmm. on, a, on a presidential election. Less traffic. Only at one school, though. Right. Correct. Okay. Right. Then it should be the same. 
still one school, one election, the same number of possible voters. Mm -hmm. it's I get shown, it that there's going to be been, way more on the board. It's fourth. been shown not to, the numbers. I, I totally shown. get that. Then I don't know. Yeah. I'm just. Well. So the option, again, that we talked about is moving the last day of school to the 17th. And with one snow day, we end on the 20th, which is a Friday. And with two snow days, we go till the 23rd. And with five, we'll go to the 20th. Wait, if you end yeah, on the 17th, one snow day puts you on the 18th. Yeah, right, that would, and then. You said the 20th. Because Juneteenth do, is the 19th. Right, so if, if we go You still have to, wiggle room, honestly, you still have wiggle room. I don't know, I just, I can't, I, I, there are crazy people out there, and I know it's a small election, but to Glenn's point, it's still an election, and there are gonna be parents who are going to be furious that we're doing this. And like Michelle said, other than, I, I, I can't think of another issue that I received so many emails and phone calls about than having the school open on a voting day. Um, it's kids' safety, it's staff safety. Um, you think about people voting driving in and out of there, and then parents are gonna be leaving, picking up their kids. Um, I just, I, I, I think you have wiggle room at the end of the day, at the end of the, 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 the year. I think, I think you do. I mean, Juneteenth is Juneteenth, but you, it puts you at the 17th. It's just one extra day for the safety of kids. And follow when up does on. the calendar have to be certified by? It doesn't, but the sooner it's certified. This is some we should the, have a dis or an actual yeah. discussion about. This is the first I've heard of it, you know. Well, this is the second reading of the calendar. I do remember before we just kind of read it, but we didn't discuss this day. Uh, this is the first day I'm sure. hearing about this particular day. Okay. About, so. And the other recommend suggestion I would make is, is other schools have moved to going to school on Good Friday. Mm. Which, Which we have done in the past hands I understand. This year. And I would make that suggestion, potentially. You're pointing, Chris. I can't Just to follow up with Glenn, this is uh, this is what we're doing, so we can resolve it. This is the discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fine. And, and, and you could we could move to not vote this today. There again, there's That's nothing. What I meant. There's yeah. nothing there. We can always discuss it at a different okay. point. So, as so, chair, I'd like to um, move it to our next meeting, if mm -hmm. possible. Where tonight That's we're kind of busy. Can, and can, can we just we give the parents a motion? But, but what I would say to parents is maybe look at maybe affirming the first day of school because more people care about the first day of school making vacation plans now than the last day of school next year in 20, yeah. in 25. You know what I mean? But if we can pretty much say the first week of school looks pretty good, like kids yep. are going to be here on the 28th, okay. mm -hmm. so plan your vacations, kids are going to come to school that week. Uh, and, and towards the end of the year, we can have further discussion. I have no issues with that. It's more or less that I get the phone, but when are you going to establish a calendar? Because we got camps, we got this, right. and daycare, and things like that. So, yeah. We but can if do those it. are topics on the table, I would look at Good Friday, mm -hmm. and I would look at the end of the year. The 23rd is, is the issue that used to be a day to play, but because of the way the holiday, the winter holiday falls this year, it's a Monday, and by looking at the, the, the teacher's contract, if it falls on a Monday or Tuesday, it's a day off. Mm -hmm. One more. Sure. Quick. Once the calendar is certified, we cannot go back and then. Yes, you can. You can yeah. always go back. Let's certify it now and you can discuss that day another time. You can always do that. It's up to you guys. That's what I was going to suggest yeah. because we could have further discussion about that. Just certify as is and change. And then, <coughs> would you like Make to do a, that? And then, it, and then it can be out there. Sorry. Okay, right, okay. where people can come in and I would love to hear what people have to say. That's what I mean. Okay. That's a good idea. Yeah. My, my motion's withdrawn. Okay. Bring it back. Motion to certify. All right. Do I have a second? I think it was already removed. Was it Dave? Is it you that? No, I withdrew my second when you put the right. motion. Yeah. So now we have a new one. Oh, oh, yeah. Quinn's looking for a second. I'll He's second. looking for a second on re redoing it now, recertifying it. Mm -hmm. with, the, with discussing that particular day right. later but in the future. We don't need to vote that. We don't really need to. So. Just put it on the next agenda. Yeah, we'll yeah. just put it on the next. Okay. okay. Works for me. All right, <coughs> that's fine. Field trips. Okay, next we have field trip requests. Uh, Whitman Middle School, eighth grade class trip to New York City and Philadelphia, and the Hanson Middle School trip to Washington, D.C. Motion to accept as presented. Second. Any questions? Those have been attached. We had those last, last week. Mm -hmm. So, no questions? Okay, all in favor? Okay, unanimous. 
Okay. Oh, got it? Oh, I'm still doing my paperwork. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. Um, uh -huh. moving to the budget discussion? Yes. Okay. So tonight, uh, we'll be looking to certify a number to the uh, towns on the assessment. And I actually, Jen has language for each of you once we get to the motion to certify so that anyone on the committee can, can make that motion to certify an assessment to the towns. Um, but before we get into that, I just want to go over a couple of things. Um, I did make an error um, in the, on the February 7th uh, presentation around grade six at Hanson Middle. Uh, uh, yeah, they were grade, grade six in Hanson. I, there were six sections listed, listed as far as six, um, six sections of staff. It's actually five. Um, so we never added an additional staff member there. It's just, it's five and it's been five. So I just wanted to let you folks know that. Um, the other topic that's come up uh, from a few folks in, in the communities is non-mandated transportation. And for the six years that I've, this is my sixth budget, we've talked about non-mandated transportation. So um, tonight we are going to ask, or I will ask, and it's been on, it's on our sheets, I'll ask the committee to entertain a motion to support non-mandated transportation tonight. Uh, the cost to Hanson uh, doing the, using the methodology that we have by mile is $47,876. And Whitman's assessment for non-mandated is, is $181,000, uh, 181,780. Um, as we know, and maybe clarifying for some folks on the committee who are new and or people in town, uh, non-mandated transportation isn't part of our school budget or assessments. It's a, it's a separate line in the communities, uh, and the towns actually vote that, um, and we ask the, the voters to support that. Since this is a, is a hot topic, I asked Karen uh, Villanueva, who's been our director of transportation since I've been here, so six years, and she was an assistant for, for many, many years prior to that. Um, and I just want to share some of her thoughts to the committee uh, about how that might impact either our finances or our community. So um, in removing, she said, I apologize for the lengthy email. Karen's not a very uh, wordy person. She's brief and to the point, but she, she kind of said what she said. Um, there are several implications if this happens. First, we currently run 17 buses at the high school. We only have four non-mandated students for the high school. This means we can't lower the fleet below 17 buses. If we remove non-mandated non students from Whitman Middle, Hanson Middle, Conley, Duval, and Indian Head, this would only change the busing tiers, and we have four tiers of, of, of assessment uh, for buses. I can only guess, and she highlighted guess, uh, by the current number of students that are at Hanson Middle School, buses would drop down, or from eight to seven, meaning only seven would report there, from eight to five in Whitman, Indian Head would drop from nine to seven, and Conley would drop from eight to two, and Duval from eight to two. So right now, I have eight uh, buses running be because of those tiers. One bus out of those 17 might just do one tier, which is a little bit more expensive. If this involves both Whitman and Hanson, um, this would result in restructuring busing tiers, not eliminating buses. And again, an approximate guess is a, is a savings to the assessment of the towns of between two hundred and forty and two hundred sixty thousand dollars right now. I can't give an exact number because of unanticipated enrollments making it the seventy five percent capacity. Remember, we need to in district have a seventy five percent capacity on our buses, and actually getting the buses to school on time. And she said, if Hanson is on board, because right now they have no walkers because they have no sidewalks. Um, this is the point that she wants to stress, and, and I don't live in the communities. I only go there sometimes, or to the schools during drop off and pick up sometimes and, and see what it is. With the additional parent picking up and students walking, this may impose a huge impact on student drop off and pick up at each schools. Our schools are not equipped to handle the, to handle the additional impact this will have. Um, I can't guess how long dismissals may take. Estimated example. Conley has 351 students on non-mandated right now. So if, if we want to say out of those 351, we will add 200 cars and 151 walkers, we're adding 200 cars to Conley. Duval is 337. Split that again, you know, you might be adding 200 cars and 137 walkers. Whitman Middle School has 251, Anson Middle has 71, and Indian Head has, has 136 students. Um, she's thinking out loud. If 300, 200 plus parents are picking up at Conley School, Route 18 may be backed up, Forest Street would be gridlocked, and High Street would be gridlocked. 
Duval doesn't have any space to house additional cars. South Ave would be, would be gridlocked. Um, how long would it take to get out of Whitman Middle School? If you live on Forest Street, Hart and Ross Drive, and I don't know where that is, High Street, Corthell Ave, South Ave, Regal Street, Apollo Road, and have to get out of your home, you might not be able to do that during drop off and pick up. A few examples of designated walkers for Conley School would now be as far as Pine Haven Drive, Lance Ave, Burton Ave, Harvard Street, Fieldston Street, the Toll House Condos, uh, Washington Terrace, both sides of Route 27 and 18 and 14, Old Mansion Lane, Sportsman Trail, 855 Temple Street, including Myrtle Ave Apartments and Mary De Deb Care. A uh, few examples of walkers for Duval would be as far as Washington Street, both sides, Commercial Street, Broad Street, the Marble Ave Apartments, Park Ave, Alden Street, all neighborhoods on both sides of Route 58 up to Lyons Lane and Bradford, Plymouth Street, both sides of 27, Temple Street and Franklin Street, adding in crossing over the railroad tracks at the dangerous four-way intersection of Ple Pleasant Street, South Ave and Franklin Street. Um, we also would need the cost of additional crossing guards that aren't necessarily in the school budget but are in the town budget. So in considering that piece, those are the pieces, not only the financial cost, it's the, the human factor of getting to school on time and, and coming home. Right now, and, and Assistant Superintendent slash Principal Farrow of the Duval School uh, was there at dismissal at Duval, and Duval dismissal starts with our eight buses at 310, 315, and the last parent is picking up their student at 335 as teachers are walking out the door, correct? Yeah, and, and even at Whitman Middle, because we all know that the Department of Transportation took down that, that stop sign, that, that light that used to be at Corthell Lab and the old Muffler Master, I don't know what's yeah. there now. But um, I was going there this morning for a 7.30 meeting and it's just, I got stopped at Cumberland's and, and it was just inching, 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 inching. I mean, really, if you look at Forest Street, these are one of those things where I think police and fire would have to be involved because do you have to make Forest Street a one way? And then... Who, who's going to be the crossing guard on, on 18 and Forest Street at the end of the day to try to get people out and kids out? I just think it's something that we need to think about from a gridlock standpoint um, and a human dynamic standpoint. Because for those students who had students at the Whitman Middle School, everybody always says the kids are on their bikes going in and out of the traffic as the school leaves. If you had 300 or 250 or so students to that, you're putting a lot of traffic in the town but that's not my decision, so I just wanted to let you know what it looks like. So again, it, was, it came to my attention, some folks had brought it up, I wanted, before we get into the assessment conversation, I wanted folks to know, Stephen, you had asked about non-mandated busing last week, Correct. just what it is, what happens, and again, it's a different line item on the budget, it's not in the school budget, we asked the towns to fund that in a different line item. Okay, and I, I'd like to speak to it too before I go to everybody else. I have had to pick up at my grandchildren at Conley and Duval, and let me tell you, it is not pleasant. It takes forever, because you get in a line, or if you can get into the line, uh, once you get in the line and you, you know, weave your way through, there's just no space, you know, um, if you've been to those two elementary schools, especially Duval, there is no space to have cars come in and out. So personally, you know, to me it would be a nightmare. But that's just me. Fred? Quick question. Does that address the sex offenders and houses that we can't have children walking by? We haven't looked at, I mean, haven't gotten that. So deep that could add additional sure. buses as well? Well, it, it, yeah. I mean, it's the timing, the, the time piece is, is problematic too. Just getting kids to school on time because of traffic is going to be an issue and then how we reroute. And I don't know if we're going to have exact tiers. I, I don't know, but kind of rolling it over because this is a conversation that we've had um, and that that's the reality. We, we adjusted our how we calculate that and there's some discussion more in the regional agreement how we do that for mandated busing and how we go give it to the state. However, this is specifically for the students that um, live within you know less than a mile and a half. So I'd like to make a motion that we support non-mandated busing to be assessed to the towns as originally presented in our budgets. Second. Okay, further discussion. Don? Um, I have a question on the letter from Karen. She indicated 17 buses at the high school and we can't, what was her words? We can't go lower, we can't lower that. Um, and then 
you know, there was a statement made that our schools aren't equipped to handle the additional impact. Um, I, I know area towns are not busing kids who live similar um, distance from the schools. So I think there's an opportunity here to, to one, maybe talk to some of the area schools and area towns and see how they're doing it and how the impact is to them. Um, because in the issue of kids on their bikes and riding you know, in and out of traffic, that's not acceptable at all. But it also ties into last week when I talked about safe routes to schools. There's a Massachusetts department that will help us. They will come out and evaluate. I actually got a phone call back from the representative today who handles the Southeast region. She was happy to talk to me. I'll be happy to forward it on to the committee for further review and decision on how as a committee choose to move forward, but they come out for free and they do evaluations and they do traffic studies and they have grant programs. So there's opportunity here. And if, if the traffic is so bad around the schools now, we should be asking, are these families that we are, or the town is paying to have a seat available on a bus? and yet they're driving if the traffic is that bad. And that's one of the studies that Safe Routes to School will also do. They'll work with a free survey and ask people, what cross section of streets do you live near? So they don't even have to give their address. And how do you get to school? And then they do a visual map to assess how people are traveling to and from their home to school. I just think there's um, an opportunity here for savings. And if we get to the budget piece and we're looking to save two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars, maybe this is an opportunity. Maybe. But if we can find out information um, again about the buses that it's seventeen and it can't go lower, um, I'd I'd like to get more information on why it can't go lower. Because actually, if we look at the budget booklet on buses, we're talking about high school kids. I mean, we can add up how many high school kids there are, right? There's four, you said, non-mandated. So we're talking about the mandated kids. We have to bust them. So there is 909. Eight, 923, sorry. 923. So 17 buses for 900 kids. Uh, George, did you want to? Well, I, I just uh, I was just going to echo what Don said. There are four non-mandated students at the high school. So as a result of the regional agreement, we, we provide right now a seat for those people. So that's why the number of buses have to stop where it is. It's also a geographical distance issue because if you put if you ha if you make less buses for students, you then have to pick them up earlier, and then you will then have kids waiting for buses longer or not because the geographical distance, especially in Hanson, is such that'll happen. It'll then have a ripple effect to the other schools. Yeah. So it's just things to consider. Okay. Yes, Hillary. Um, so I teach in a district that um, they charge for busing. It's a not regional district, but I can speak to the traffic piece. Um, Jeff, maybe you can speak to the traffic mm -hmm. piece too. Um, a lot of, it's a high school, so kids drive, um, but there are buses, but a lot of parents drive their mm -hmm. kids, a lot, a considerable amount. Um, because there's a cost um, and because they share buses with the middle school to George's point that ripple effect kids are on the bus if they have to take the bus they're on the bus for 45 minutes to an hour in the morning so it's mm -hmm. a long bus ride in the morning mm -hmm. um, if you don't so I contractually have to be there by 7 20 in the morning if I am not hauling down learning lane by 7 10 I will get stopped at the hockey rink and I don't know if you guys know where the Hobblemock hockey rink is in relation to Pembroke High School but it's a mile easily mm -hmm. um, and it is so so the implications of traffic are real um, we have we have significant it's changed a little bit but we used to have significant tardy problems with students who drove or parents mm -hmm. who dropped their kids off um, I, I sometimes see Jeff in the parking lot at seven o'clock dropping his kids off. School doesn't start till 7.30. Mm -hmm. So it makes kids get there way earlier than they need to be. Mm -hmm. So it's cutting in on their other things and uh, sleep and, and you know other things like that. So it is a real issue. Um, for me, I think that the 
the walking on busy roads. If I think about Hanson, kids at the Hanson Middle School are gonna be walking on Route 58, and I know they do on half days anyway, but there are some kids who don't, who would probably be in this non-mandated because their parents don't feel it is safe for them to do so. Um, now they're not necessarily given the choice. Um, same with Indian Head, it's Route 58. My kids would be walkers to Indian Head because I would be in that area. I live on Borland Drive. Where are they gonna go? They're, they're gonna walk on Route 58 at eight o'clock in the morning when people are flying and they're on their cell phones? I don't think so. You know, so, so these are things that, um, you know, I, I just talked about the calendar and about safety of kids, and you know, I think that that's the, the prevailing issue, the safety of the kids. I understand trying to save money, but it shouldn't be at the cost of the safety of the kids. Oh, you can take Fred's motion. Yeah. Okay, so Fred, you want to speak and to your motion? To echo what Hillary was just saying, the safety of kids, um, this is also outside of our operating budget. It's also a line that has come down substantially since we changed the formula around. Mm -hmm. So the towns from three years ago are seeing approximately a 50% reduction. I think they're happy to see that. And at the same time, they pay for crossing guards. Who knows if they have to provide additional crossing guards. And you want to make sure that every kid is going to be safe when walking to school and getting to school. So, you know, the non-mandated is a no-brainer for me. Uh, Jeff, you're looking for a separate motion for that? No, yes. you did already. Yeah, you already gave, no, I can read the So that was just so we don't have, I mean, because if, if the committee wants to look at that, it, we have to skew where we're at. If that's going to be a cut, it's it's not, it's an accessible cut in the assessment, because if non-mandated comes out of the, the, the piece for the towns as a separate line item, then I'm looking at different tiers and looking at a change of maybe 260,000 of reimbursable funds uh, from from the mandated side, because we'd have to address those tiers. It's not worth it. All right, so we have a motion on the floor, okay? And that motion is, um, I'll, I'll read the official how it's gonna read, okay? Um, Hanson, FY25 Hanson non-mandated trans, uh, transportation assessment, moved to certify the Whitman Hanson Regional School District fiscal year 2025 non-mandated transportation assessment for the town of Hanson in accordance with the PK-12 Whitman Hanson Regional School District Agreement section uh, 4E2 and Mass General Laws chapter 71 section 16B at, and it would be 47,876. And let me just, and the, the for Whitman, the non-mandated transportation assessment, I move to set the Whitman Hanson Regional School District fiscal year 2025 non-mandated transportation assessment for the town of Whitman in accordance with the PK-12 Whitman Hanson Regional School District Agreement section 4E2 and Mass General Laws chapter 71 section 16B at 181,780. Okay, those were your two amounts. Those are the motions. Yep. Just need a second. Uh, we did that. We had a motion and a second. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. All in favor, raise your hands, please. Okay, and against? Okay, one opposed. Thank so you that is pleasure. passed, so we have so that number. You keep those so you perfect. have that number. So moving on to the, the regional school assessment, uh, I gave you some figures last last week. Um, you know, sadly, we, we really didn't, the budget I proposed um, in February, we we're looking at a level service budget at a 5.1% at a increase. Um, it didn't go over well with our communities as we saw within the budgets that I presented you last week, um, the towns are are, are earmarking us at a 5% assessment, which the 5% assessment is a real challenge to our district budget. Knowing that, and you know, again, and I, I, I want to say thank you to Mary Beth and Lisa for providing me budgets and numbers so I can speak like I, I know what I'm talking about a little bit, and knowing where they're at, and we've had some good conversation. We might not agree where we're at right now, but I appreciate the transparency of, of having some numbers to work with. Um, so I presented the committee some options or what that would look like if we come down from 5.13, uh, all the way down to, and, and Hillary brought this up last week saying, hey, you gave us these numbers, does that include unemployment? So the updated numbers include 
if we start reducing uh, past people that are not employed as of June 30th or, or July 1st, 2024, um, we start getting into unemployment numbers. So the first line, again, I'm gonna go over this, and still my recommendation, if we have to, if this committee um, will needs to move away from the 5.13% assessment, um, I still recommend potentially using one-time funds. I know Justin doesn't like to hear that, but I'm gonna recommend that or suggest that using circuit breaker funds uh, and not replacing my retirements in slash non-renewals for a total of five positions cut, or that line of a total cut of $910,500, which would make our budget, overall budget, not assessment number, overall budget, 4.04% increase. Now, John did clarify for me because I made a mistake. Um, e and D isn't is in expenditures, it's revenue, so it, do, it, it doesn't, it, it affects how that budget looks, but not the assessments. So when I said, hey, if we use E&D, this is a cut, it's not, it's actually a revenue number. So that's why last week it was 3.65, it's 4.04, because we're actually using our own revenue to support the budget, if that makes sense. And if it doesn't, John can explain it a little more. But that assessment to the town of Whitman would be, uh, 19,135,687 or a 7.87% increase in their assessment, an enhanced assessment of 14,974,736 or a 7.68 assessment. And then I drew that line because that's where it gets a little bit more uncomfortable. Um, cutting five positions in the district isn't awesome. Um, there are retirements and like I said, non-renewals that we could probably get by. It won't be a tremendous increase of class size. However, services will be lost. It's not level service. Level service is taking what we have this year and putting it into next year. There will be five less people um, who are making their exit anyway. So it's not a pink slip. It's not, it's not an unemployment um, issue. But there will be five less people in the district um, professional staff members than this year. Um, so when we get past that line, um, then we factor in unemployment, and unemployment is a 40% cost for every person that we pink slip, as of the day that their contract is null and void, okay? So to get closer, again, trying to do it the best way I, I thought, would be kind of coming down a percentage at a, at a pop. So, Getting the assessment down um, to a Whitman assessment of $18,917,397 or a 6.84 assessment and a Hanson assessment of $14,838,025 or a 6.85% assessment, I would have to pink slip seven employees or let them go. Now, um, with that 40% unemployment, um, that's why we had, to, it was a five number, yes? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Fred, hold on. Fred, we had somebody already on the Oh, list. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, um, all right. at, at, you yeah. want us at this point in time? You yes, please. Okay. Yeah. I just ask if you can tell us what positions are the five retiring no, staff I, members I, from? I'm, I'm not, I, I won't say that at this point because it's retirements and non-renewals and replacements of those folks. So I don't know, I know who my retirements are and their retirements in elementary and high school. And, but is it a classroom teacher? They're all classroom, they're classroom teachers. Because it could be a nurse in elementary. It could be, it could <laughs> so, be. I'm sorry. So, but that's, I need to have that flexibility in, in who I need to replace based on what we need next year. So I'm looking at five professional positions that are going to be lost. Okay. And, it, and likewise, it could be in the budget book in a maintenance staff member retiring. So no. this is why I ask because it depends on the cost center, it, right? It, it, so it, if it, this it, is coming out of a teaching cost center. These, these right now are all teachers. Five so, retirements of teachers. Right. Fair enough. Five Thank retirements you. plus some non-renewals or people moving on. They're not just retirements. 
Okay. So they're non-renewals, which some of those people don't know that yet. Okay. So we can't say their names. Okay. We can't say the position, okay, because they're not been notified. So uh, the problem, I just want to interrupt for a second. I'll be right with you, Fred. The problem we have also is some information we won't have until April 1st. Um, or, people, later. or later. Or later, of mm -hmm. people returning who might not want to return from maternity leave or things like that. We don't have that. But we have to set this today to submit so things can change, but we don't know that at this time. That's that's an issue, and that's you know where we have to look at. As far that's as with the, the unemployment, um, we wouldn't start unemployment until the, well, July, till their contract ends, mm -hmm. uh, which is July 1st. Mm -hmm. Everybody remember that. So um, that's a little bit different. It's not like as soon as this is done, we start their unemployment because we don't. So, but that. but that is good information for folks to know. If a teacher doesn't have a contract as of June thirtieth, they are technically unemployed. So their unemployment starts, and I have to start. We start compensating July first, even if they're coming until they get a notice back from me that they're back, or from another school district or another place of employ that's equal to the salary that they were making here. And we learned that through COVID. And when we had the fiscal 21 budget in 2020, uh, because I pink slipped 62 folks, because I had to, I didn't know what, what budget, budget we were going to have, and people started collecting unemployment July 1st. So, and all those, most of those people came back or had found gainful employment. And the, the challenge, I'm, I'm not trying to be shady, if that's a word to say, I have retirements, and there are some retirements I'm going to fill, and there are some retirements I'm not going to fill. Um, and it's just going to depend on enrollment and what numbers look like as we roll them out in scheduling with each building next year. And again, to be fair, there are folks here that might not be coming back because of certain evaluations and they haven't been notified yet and it's not appropriate to, to put them out there in public. Um, so it's, I'm looking at if we go, to, and Fred had a question though, yeah. too, I'm sorry. Yeah, right. So just looking at the very first below the line, statement of cuts. It was five staff originally, mm -hmm. and now it's been increased to seven, and it shows unemployment, but if someone's retiring. These aren't the retirements. These are now people. Okay, so we're. Five up top, so it's 12, really. Right, but this is the up top, I thought. No. No. So it's five plus seven. But this is. Proposed cuts using e and and circuit breaker. Yeah, that's separate than the one we're talking about with the, that's separate from the unemployment one, Fred. Okay. Fred, that's the next number down. All right, so that's the 560,500 non-renewable mm -hmm. replacements. Okay. Yeah. Right, so we yes. don't do, so we don't do I unemployment on those. Yeah, we don't do unemployment on those. Sure. And, and, and one of the things that if those folks, if we pink slip them and they find another job, that unemployment reduces in that sixth or seventh teacher that was let go can potentially come back, you know. Um, and I won't know that till the summer. But again, that gets us down to that critical assessment number of uh, for Whitman 6.84 and Hanson 6.85. Um, if we did the top and the next layer, I call it number, you know, two. Um, total proposed cuts using E and D and circuit breaker. We have, we have now cut the budget as presented on February 7th, uh, 1.208,700 or $1,208,700. That's what we would be of use in E and D and, and proposed cuts. If we have to get closer to that five, and I didn't get to five, I only got to 5.58 because I stopped there. We're looking at an additional 8.5 staff members, um, which would reduce the Whitman assessment to $18,655,450, or a 5.58 assessment. And Hansen's number would be $14,673,972, or 5.85% assessment. With total reductions in that area, we're making our school budget a 2.95% increase over last year. And total proposed cuts using e and Circuit Breaker of $1,570,800. Uh, 
uh, or 20 professional staff member positions, and I'm saying professional staff members, not to, uh, to shy away from paraprofessionals, but I have not looked at paraprofessionals. They are professionals as well, but these are teaching positions or district positions that I'd be looking at as far as 20.5. 20, 20 classroom teachers, um, areas that support classroom teachers, and as I said um, last week, we won't be looking at interventionists for that position. People could bump into those positions, special education positions, or EL staff, um, because those are required um, really by law to make sure we have those supports in place. Uh, I had told the committee, and I shared with the district today, you know, where cuts could come from. Um, the only where, where, way I could take cuts from, and, and if you're kind of reading between the lines a little bit, I'm looking at Conley, Indian Head, Hanson Middle School, Whitman Middle School at the, at the grade levels. Um, you can maybe assume that some of the retirements are coming from the high school um, because they are, they are getting cuts as well. Um, so those are, these are where the additional cuts could go and they would increase class sizes. We have, as I said, admirable class sizes and we've worked really hard as a community to service our students, especially in K to, K to five, six through eight, with class sizes that are um, K to five, really 20 and under, um, six through eight, 20 to 22, and then the high school around the 22 to 25. Um, cutting these positions here would bring almost every elementary and middle school class size 225 um, with hopefully no move-ins um, that's a guesstimate um, but they'd be up um, to that level that we had pre-19 and uh, a community member asked me today are, were there any studies and I thought this was a good question were there any studies done about optimal class size and I said yeah a lot before 2019 before 2020 and COVID I said nobody's really talking about that now because kids are different I said 20 25 in a high school class used to be pretty doable still doable but it's different 25 in an elementary classroom was was a little large but still manageable 20 is challenging now and it is and I'm speaking from somebody that has talked to quite a few classroom teachers is it doable absolutely our staff is good and we have interventions but George did mention last week we got where we are progressing and educating our kids all kids and all kids are making gains there will be a restructure of how that happens if we end up with 25 kids in a classroom and what that looks like. Will we service our kids? Absolutely. Will school open next year? Absolutely. Will that be a change in how we deliver services to our students? Absolutely. And are we in the same spot as we are every year? And there's a six year running of what are we <laughs> doing to cut and maybe do this and maybe do that? Um, yes. Um, I, think, I think if we wanna have a, a good faith, and I've heard about good faith, um, if the committee wants to support the 4.04% increase of the budget um, with non-renewing, with the non-renewals and the retirements, I think that's really not affecting um, my K-8 to students. Will it affect my 9-12 to students? Somewhat. Um, is it more manageable? And I can speak as the former high school principal. I think it's, it's, it's doable. I've been there before, and my, that staff can handle it. I really get anxious uh, about the service piece to students once we go below that and start moving five members, seven members, eight members, 10 members, and how that affects the students in the classrooms now. And like I said, I'm very confident in the professionalism of my staff, but they will have to teach differently. If we go from 20 to 25, the one-to-one -one interactions in a classroom is different. And again, I mentioned that to that community member. I used to teach high school and had a class of 27, but when you threw 30 in there, it was different. I could handle 27, believe it or not, but the three extra students just threw the game. And it depends on that student and, and the day of the week. The intervention piece and the supports we have through special education and English language learner support is extremely helpful. And the wind blocks have been essential, but this will change. Um, and I think, doing our due diligence we've worked really hard to be here if the committee comes out and supports where we're at right now I'd love to get the 5.3 but I also am realistic and and, and don't want to seem like we're 
you know, grasping. I'm not sure of the word. 5.3 is level service. We, we deserve level service, but this is where we're at. This is a, a suggestion slash recommendation that I would have coming out of the gate. Um, I also included in your packets, and another question came from uh, the members about class where kids are at, uh, as far as ELs and special ed. We're not cutting those because those are unknown numbers too. Um, they're also challenge, they're, it's, it, it's challenging right now to service those students because that student population is growing more and more every day. Um, and the where we can cut right now are classroom teachers, related arts staff as we go, um, based again, what the team, when given the number, the final number from the district, or at town meeting, my team will work together with the building principals and the association to make sure that students are serviced and, and we remove and staff members equitably across the district. So that's where we're at. Fred. I believe it was last November, you know, that I said, if we want to fix it, we have to fix it right. And if we needed an override, we needed to have it structured so it's not a band-aid. As this budget is structured right now, if the selectmen of the FinCon have a separate line for an override for our portion, it's a band-aid. And we're back in the same position without adding the product or the programs that we should be doing uh, and let the taxpayers decide. You know, they're the ones footing the bill, bless you. Uh, they're the ones footing the bill, and it's up to us to make the case, this is what we should have, this is what we need to have. You know, languages in the middle schools, uh, the robotics program, as well as the other bits and pieces that are far beyond my grasp, and that's why we have a professional administration. But if we're going to do it, we need to do it right. And my fear is that we end up with a band aid this year. And people are going to feel like, well, we just gave them money. And you're done for five years. That's my big fear. And we we're talking about doing anything that the town's can support within their current operating budget. And I know both towns are in dire circumstances. Uh, you know, they allotted us money. The problem isn't the towns, the problem is the state. It's mm -hmm. the way they fund Chapter 7. Yeah. They give us a minuscule amount. They don't cover their percentage of any reasonable increase. And we're expected to move forward. Yeah, it's just, it's a horrible, horrible situation that we're stuck in. Okay. David? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so Fred, I, I think, you made a lot of great points there. And one of the things uh, Mr. Small just talked about was putting a band-aid on the budget. And I'd like to remind the committee of what we did three years ago. In March of 2021, the only time since I've been here that the committee unanimously supported the budget, the superintendent came out and said, this particular year, because of the pandemic, I'm requesting that we don't add any more services. So we supported the level service budget unanimously. A couple weeks later, April 7th of 2021, the committee came back and the superintendent asked the committee for the sake of partnership to reduce our assessment by $775,000. What we did is take those mental health services, the interventionalists, and roll it into, at that point in time, it was ESSER 2, which was state aid, basically. One-time funding from the state to help us during the pandemic. Anyway, the, the vote failed. It, vote, it failed on a 6-2 to 1 vote. We came back the following week and the assessment uh, passed on an 8-2 to two vote. Myself being one of the committee members who voted against it because I did not agree with the idea that we're taking one-time funding and putting them into our operating budget knowing we're going to need long-term. One of the discussion points that was talked about during that meeting was putting a band-aid on the budget. And the understanding was that we are going to work with the towns for the sake of partnership with the idea of rolling over that funding into our operating budget when ESSER runs out. Now, flash forward to last year, we added, I believe, approximately 500,000 of E&D into the budget. I did not show up for that meeting because it was to my knowledge, and we've talked about this publicly, that a predetermined deal was made on what that figure should be. So while the protest, I did not show up to that particular meeting. Another thing I'd like to point out as well, when we're talking about finances, we use the term, we don't, but uh, the 
town, the board of selectmen in particular, select boards like to use the, the narrative school override. The way I perceive that is poor public policy on their end and a lack of accountability. Because when you're looking at the excess levy capacity, the two and a half that they've not utilized fully last decade, they left, the town of Whitman in particular, left $4.1 million on the table. Even if they collected half of that, we would not be in a position we are now. Look at 2016, they did not collect their levy. We had devastating cuts. Look at 2019, we lost 19.2 jobs. And when those 19 point two jobs went out, and those pink slips went out, we had teachers crying in the building and to the point where the atmosphere was so depressing that students says, what the hell is going on? We need to get involved. So students then sent out a district email. None of the school committee members responded, but a, a parent did and talked to us about the levy and gave us that information and used that. And students then went and interviewed teachers throughout the district. And you know what these teachers told me? They told me they were going on Google to develop their curriculum. How quick we forget that it was just a few years ago that teachers did not have the tools they needed to succeed at the earliest levels, building the foundational blocks for our most important asset. That is our youth, our students. And let me remind you folks, I went to the MASC slash MASS conference meeting. The administration was there. And one of the things that they talked about is what is our role as school committee members? I know it gets confused a lot of the times, but who are our constituents? Yes, we are elected by taxpayers, people who are old enough to vote, but our constituents are actually the students. And what we are looking to do is promote student achievement. So by doing this, by reducing our assessment, by cutting these jobs, we are once again bailing the community out of their lack of responsibility, and they want to, they want to blame the towns. They want to blame the schools and say, hey, this is your fault, when really they are not doing their job and utilizing the levy and following your own policy. Let's talk about the Madden report. The Madden report that was done in Whitman said an override was needed in FY20 or FY21. That was not done. And the reasoning for the override was so that all departments were adequately funded, which they wouldn't have to deal with if they properly collected the levy. Now let's look at Hanson. Hanson's not dealing with school override, they're dealing with a $5 million operational override because they have not adequately collected their funds and they need it to be able to support not just the school department, but all departments. So we can sit here and we take content, once again, take one-time funding, like we've done with e and like we've done it with ESSER, like we've done with Circuit Breaker, kick the can down the road, but next fiscal year, when you're dealing with the problem again, you have no one to look at but yourself. So you can pride yourself being an accountant, a teacher, whatever your perspective is, but if you sit here and you cut these services, you're actually you speak louder than your words. So understand what we're doing with, what we're dealing with, and how we got in this position. If you want to go further back in history repeating itself, we are standing here in, in the midst of landmark state legislation. If you go back to 1993, when the, when the schools regionalized fully to be able to get that incentive of state aid, they were getting a bunch of contributions from the state in the late 90s, early 2000s. And what did they do with that opportunity? They didn't invest in education. The towns did not add anything to their contributions while the states did. Now, look at it. It has gone over the last 10, 20, 30 years. It's not just a vacuum of one single fiscal year. There's lack of investment in our community that has put us in the situation, whether it's the Great Recession, the opioid epidemic, a pandemic, generations of students are suffering. I mean, look at me. People, I'm glad to be here, but it should be a little bit disgusting that a student feels they need to run to be able to bring change, and then even furthermore, that the community that elects them because they feel as if they have a better opportunity to bring change than the people who are currently sitting in that seat. That is a disturbing feeling. And people should really think about that for a little bit. So I ask you folks to really consider the last several decades, not just this one particular fiscal year, and make a responsible decision for our students. That is our constituents. Let's represent them. Let's respect them. Let's care about them. We've had a student advisory committee tell us for years that they need to be a students killing themselves. We've had friends. I've seen it for years, over and over. We need to support them. So do what is best. It's, a, what is best from our judiciary standpoint. It is best for student achievement. We cannot turn our backs on our students, on our teachers, who need us the most. So I ask you folks to listen to me, listen through the financial argument, the emotional argument, understand the human aspect as what we were just talking about, and support our students and support our community. The greatest asset we have in either Whitman or Hanson is our regional school district, and do not forget that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Chris? Yeah, um, I agree with Fred. Um, doesn't make any sense to go to an override um, when we're providing a less than uh, level service budget, right? That, I mean, wh when it's like how many, the old expression, you know, you get, a, you get one bite at the apple, right? For, for quite a long time, probably. And so it doesn't make any sense to me to, to, to cut this budget and then go and try to fund it through an override. So. Well, can, can you ask? I don't mean to put Mary Beth and or Lisa on the spot. With your five, or Justin or Sean, with with the earmark of five percent right now in your budgets, are you level or are you in deficit still? 
I don't know. And I don't know if you can't answer that right now. It, it, with a 5% assessment from the schools, are your overall budgets still in deficit or are they set? And again, if you don't know, that's fine because we're still in the middle of it. But with the earmark as set, is there still a deficit in your budget? And do you still have to make cuts? Um, Mary Beth Carter. Sorry, but. Uh, nope, that's okay. Um, so right now where I am, um, we plan to use 500,000 out of free cash, one-time money, which we don't want to do either. Um, and so I'm almost there at level okay. using that with, with drastic um, reductions, of course, to what was requested. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, Don? Don, sorry. Sure. Um, so we have difficult decisions to make. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Don, can Lisa speak? To oh, yes, Lisa, first. right. Sorry. Thanks, Lisa. Appreciate it. <laughs> I did go to the gym, so. <laughs> Good for you. Um, so right now, uh, basically at the 5.85, we're still about almost a million in the Lisa, deficit. could you talk into the mic first? Oh, sorry. Uh, we would be about a million in the deficit. Um, our free cash is 1.4 million, so we would basically need to use most of that. Anything higher than that pretty much is going to wipe out all our free cash. It gives us nothing for capital. Um, until October, until a new free cash. So regardless of what the schools do, we're at a deficit on all of those figures, um, you, which Lisa. may be staff that. on our end as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. okay Don, go ahead. Thanks. So I was saying we have difficult decisions to make. Um, one question just simply to ask, does this budget align with our goals and our strategic plan should be number one? Um, I'm recalling last week when we were informed that the district had not invested in high quality curriculum from 2001 to 2018. Um, there was a comment uh, superintendent made at a previous meeting also, we were content uh, when he came up to central office with being marginal, mm -hmm. right? Because that's what the district had been for two decades, marginal. Um, when the pandemic hit and uh, funding was available, um, he saw greatness, he saw improvement, and the potential that what funding does matter. Um, so we are now faced with going backwards. Um, you know, I, I think back also to 2005, this building was built, right? And at that time, um, the state aid from 1993, as a school committee member fourth just mentioned, had started to dry up in the early 2000s. But the two towns invested in a building and a high school. And they still call it the new high school, 2023, 20 years later. Um, so from that point when this school building that we sit in was built, it was shiny, it was new. Um, but what you weren't seeing were the cracks on the inside. The cracks on the inside were that curriculum was not being purchased. And I'm not going to pretend to know what else was going on, but we can see the trend that there was not an investment in um, curriculum technology moving forward. Um, I still have some questions about the budget and when we think about finding savings, um, I look at class sizes the way they are right now um, and the comment was made that um, staff members may need to be removed equitably across the district. There are classes right now in our district that are 24 in the middle school. There, there are, I'm looking at these class reports that were provided to the committee. So, and there are eight classrooms in one of our middle schools that are already at 24. So the conversation just about a half hour ago was about if classes get up to there, it's, it's gonna be a different story. Well, we're there now. We're there now in some classrooms with some teachers. At the same time, we have another middle school that right now has class sizes of 14, 15, 16. And there's another school that has 24. And that's not just one, that's eight different classes. So I do have to ask um, what the rationale would be to provide staffing right now in a non-Title I school with 16 class size compared to a Title I school with 25% minority, students of color, 
um, and what the rationale would be right now with the, a first grade teacher was pulled in a Title I school with population of 62 students. So if you had 62 students, first graders, and four teachers, that's 15.5 per class. But we don't have four teachers. We have 62 students divided by three teachers for 20.6 in a first grade class in a Title I school. So we have a middle school that has 14, 15, and 16 in eighth grade in a class. And that is acceptable right now, but we also made a decision for a first grade class to have 20. So uh, I see an inequity right now that needs to be addressed, and I don't know how that can be addressed and perhaps help alleviate this budget. I'm not saying where um, it should be. But that in itself, especially when one of the schools has 25% of the population is black, brown, Hispanic kids, that can create a disparate impact. It's not intentional by the district, but it causes an impact to a minority population. What I will say right now is this budget does not have the world language elementary or middle school, does not, and this is for listeners watching, this does not expand world languages even at the high school. We don't have Mandarin, we don't have Portuguese, second language to be bilingual for our English speakers. We don't have Arabic, we don't have Latin. Many area schools do. We don't have robotics, it was mentioned, Engl elementary or middle school. We don't have a fine and prof visual performing arts director, K through 12. Mm -hmm. We don't have a full-time drama teacher staffed, which some towns have an elective as drama during the school day. This budget does not include a funding line for laptops or curriculum that I noticed. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, page 6 of document 11 says we're cutting $40,000 in laptops. Now they may all be working now and, and we may be set and there's a replenishment, but at some time that funding line is going to have to be filled. But right now it's $40,000. We're not funding our OPEB um, and we're not funding equitable class sizes, as I mentioned. Um, so. I did vote no on, on paying for the 250,000 in buses because I do believe that students can arrive safely to school. Um, but when we make sure that they all get here on a bus and there's higher class sizes like that, that's a decision this committee will make. Um, I, so I, I would just really like to, to find out about the rationale with class sizes the way they are right now because it's, it's not equitable. Yeah. So uh, I think I can hopefully provide some insight on the rationale for class sizes. Every principal of a school is charged with educating the students the best that they can. Now when it comes to the Hanson Middle School, that's what we're talking about, versus the Whitman Middle School, you have a unique situation in the demographic, not the demographic, in the makeup of the staff at the Hanson Middle School. And the reason being is that they have teachers who are in transition. Some are at the end of their career and experienced, some are coming in. But what that allows the principal to do, and it's a unique situation, and they have dwindling population, but what the, that allows the principal to do is if you have veteran teachers who've been working for a long time, they have what's called a K-6 to certification. So what Mr. Tranter has been able to do is to take those individual certifications and sort of make a teacher teach more than one subject to reduce class size. So for example, in the sixth grade, he has five sections in the sixth grade. Now what he does though is make, so let's say it's Mr. Boyce and he's got a K-6. to Mr. Boyce might teach four sections, um, he might teach four sections of one subject, one section of another subject. The state allows you to do that because you have a K-6 to certification. So then he's able to then lower class size because he makes people teach out of their subject area. Extra sections are created, so you take that 100 kids and you divide it by, or the 110 kids and you divide it by six, so you get more. The issue that happens in the seventh and eighth grade, and I agree with you, and I have the numbers going into next year with cuts if you'd like to hear those too. Uh, the issue going into seventh and eighth grade is that he has what's called a split team. So a split team 
is he has teachers that teach the four subjects because again this is not elementary school where it's I teach my students only all subjects in a middle school you have teams that teach one social studies one teacher teaches science one teacher teaches ELA one teacher teaches math and then so what he does there, they have a split team. So it's like four and seventh, four and eighth, and then they have these four teachers that try to, that, raw, that teach extra classes, two to the seventh and two to the eighth. And he's able to mix them up. Now, the issue is it lowers class size. You could wipe that whole team out. Because <laughs> again, it's springtime in Whitman Hanson, and I've done this now for my 21st spring. And in the spring of 2007, that's what happened at Whitman Middle School. We lost the split team. So we had lower class size, the superintendent at that time said we're removing those four people and we automatically shot up in class size by about nine to ten per class because I no longer had those sections. So when we look at next year at the seventh and eighth grade, if you have, they have split and if you cut some of those splits, you're looking at 124 seventh graders next year in Hanson Middle. And this is hard to wrap your mind around if you're not sure and I'm probably going to do a lousy job of explaining it but I'll give it my best shot. If you have a team of four teachers, right? If you, I mean, excuse me, if you think of the four academic subjects, at the seventh grade next year in Hanson Middle School, he will offer three courses with six sections each. Now, understand that. So let's say it's English, it's math, and it's social studies. But if you drop one of those teachers, you now only have four sections of science because you cut a teacher. So in your class sizes, you'll be averaging 20 in the seventh grade in those, in those subjects with the, with the six sections, but you'll be averaging already 28 in the science and 31 in the science because you've reduced those sections. So instead of spreading kids to six, you now only spread them to four because you cut a teacher. If there are two cuts at the, at the Hanson Middle School next year, you're looking at raising your numbers into the 30, you know, you know, well into the 30s for those subjects. The hard part is, is that you only have a limited number of teachers in sections and every year there's a, limit, there's a different number of kids that go in them. But the reason why is because you have a principal and assistant principal who can manipulate the certifications under DESE and he's trying to do the best he can for those. On the other half, in Whitman, you have high enough numbers that you have two full teams at every grade. So if you think about it, you have eight teachers in grade six that teach academics. You have two math, two reading, two ELA, two science. Same in seventh, same in eighth. So you divide that number by eight. Because of the dwindling population in Whitman, you don't have that two Two team system. So the principal now has tried to manipulate everything he can with his schedules. There can definitely be cuts, but that explains the inadequacy of what's going on. Because you're taking teachers who have different certifications and using those certifications to what the state allows to create more sections for students to lower class size. And I'll, I'll add to that too, George. I think that's an important, that, that's really important to hear for people um, that I was certified K to eight, um, which is no longer two. Um, and so I could move different grades, uh, any grade. I started with fourth, I ended up with sixth, and then went to eight and back to six. And I think that that's really important because if somebody's only K to six, really by Desi stand, you can only teach six, you know, five or six, grade five or six. So you can't go to, you know, you can teach any subject in that, but you can't go higher. So it really does restrict not only is he able to move him around, it also restricts him to what those people can do. And it's unique in a middle school, not a high school, because a high school you can cut, if you have 10 teachers in math and you cut nine, you take every kid that takes math and now they go into nine sections instead of 10. But if that kid's teacher is cut, you might get a study hall, or you might get a, a free, or you might get a different, or you might get to choose an elective. Mm -hmm. There are no electives to choose yeah. in a middle school because every student has to have every offering that every other student has, so it is really a puzzle. So when you're talking about cutting at a middle school, the easiest thing to do, which would be dev not for good for education at all, was to rip out his whole split team, just like we did at Whitman Middle years ago. Yeah. But you know, the more we do, the more we should know better. 
Do I agree that there's less class size at Whitman at Hanson Middle School? I do. Do I agree that there's other challenges at Whitman Middle School? I do. But however, that's the, that's the reason why, is because they're at a precipice of pull it all out. If they drop another 15, you'll be fine. They'll have high, same class size, lose those teachers. But it doesn't work that way presently now. Yes, John. I, I think I'd just like to add on the end, the classes, again, right now at Whitman Middle School, to equal what grade eight Hanson Middle School is, you'd need to add three teachers. That's, to do the math, you'd need to add three teachers to get the equivalent. So when we're talking about equity, I just still can't um, believe we're at this point that you know an eighth grade class is smaller than our first grade in a Title I school. Um, so that's frustrating. And I know we sat here a year and a half ago in the fall and were surprised when a parent came up and said the buses were cut at Indian Head. We used to have 12, they were cut to eight. And I was surprised because the committee hadn't been informed of that. And then to learn this past fall that paraprofessionals weren't restored in full day kindergarten classes when they used to always have a para designated to every kindergarten class. So I'm hoping that we can, it, and this speaks to why I specifically asked about those five retirements. I really want to be able to understand what I'm voting for, what the impact is going to be on the students. So it's, my focus is on the students and student achievement and, and maintaining equity. And when we're not even looking at fairness, I mean, we need to consider the, the Title I schools and the population within those schools and the English language learners. Okay, Chris? Yeah, so I've been around a little bit now, and uh, I've come to understand that we hire a superintendent, and he works with his staff to make the best decisions they can for the students. We entrust them with that. We aren't privy, nor should we be, to every individual factor you know, that goes into their decisions. They have things they have to work through, some of which can't be presented publicly out of respect and consideration for the teachers involved, the potential teachers involved. So, I don't know, I, I think we, as a school committee members, we, we should absolutely consider, continue to advocate for the students and the district in general but we need to understand that we're not superintendents. We're not assistant superintendents. We're school committee members. And furthermore, we're one of a group of 10. So we have to keep that in mind as we go through this process, as far as I'm concerned. That's how I see it. Okay. Yeah, Fred? Yeah, I agree with Mr. Scriven. You know, as I think I tried to allude to, we're not educators. You know, a lot of the decisions that they make are far above, above our heads in our pay grades, so to speak. Uh, we do entrust them. There are certain factors of the budget that I think we have the right to ask for, uh, you know, in understanding how the soup is made a little bit. But it's up to administration to make the soup. Uh, that's what they're hired to do. Uh, my biggest problem is we know that we've been allotted up to a 5% increase year after year uh, for our uh, assessment increase. Uh, I've heard from folks saying, you know, perhaps, well, the Madden report says that we were doing override. Okay. Would that have changed the 5% allotment? I don't know. Uh, and we know what the towns have penciled in and budgeted, you know, for our, you know, assessment increase. I would hope that, you know, they have specific guidelines, and I believe they do, you know, for the other departments. Uh, it's a tough, tough year. I think that what we do, and for it to affect other departments in public safety, DPW, the library, uh, you know, any town entity uh, would be unfair to them 
because the schools say we need more and we didn't plan properly for an override, etc. That, you know, can go right to the people and ask for it. I just wanted to bring that up. You know, I would not be in favor of, uh, you know, putting this on other people within our town and seeing people lose their jobs because we're trying to hold to a line, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Hillary head next. Hillary. Um, I think it's really dangerous when we start to pit departments against each other, particularly a department that services people who don't have a voice, which are the kids. That's who we are representing. That's who we serve. Um, we, this is my fourth budget, um, and I've never certified a budget in March whenever we certify them that has maintained that budget. We have been asked to cut every year for the last four years that I have been here. Uh, last year we had a joint meeting. Um, I'm not sure I would call it a joint meeting because none of us were able to speak. We just sat there and were berated by both select boards about our irresponsibility and how we are spending. What I don't hear and what I didn't hear is why. Why do you need this money? We are not asking to institute AP Chinese. We are not asking to put foreign language back in the middle schools. We're not asking for robotics. Uh, last year we were told asking for robotics was absolutely irresponsible. Um, we're asking for basic needs and services of kids. Adequate class size. So Malcolm Gladwell, I think in 2018, um, did a study podcast um, optimum class sizes are between 18 and 24. Anything less than that, you become like a family, you fight, it's not great, anything more than that, and it's too much to handle. Now, you know, teachers, we can do it. Um, but does that mean it's the right thing to do? It's not. Um, I said last week, we had this amazing presentation that our students are making gains because of what we have done, because of what we have added. We did not take ESSER funds and add foreign language to the middle school. We did not take ESSER funds and hire a K-12 drama teacher. We did not do, th that would be irresponsible. Those things would be irresponsible. We took ESSER funds and we funded positions that I, I was looking, I think legally we probably had to fund six or seven of those positions anyway, mm -hmm. or we would be violating civil rights. So let's just talk about that, right? We're not asking for an exorbitant budget. We are not like, you know, in the Globe, there was an article about Harvard and Bedford and how they have these massive overrides. You know what they have in those districts? A K-12 theater director, AP Chinese, Mandarin. I teach in Pembroke down the road. In Pembroke, students can take, uh, uh, they can start practicing a string instrument in fourth grade. So we're not just talking trumpets and saxophones. We're talking violins, cellos. Um, they, at the high school, have the opportunity to take one of four foreign languages. Uh, they have the opportunity to enroll in one of eight pathways. Um, this is just around the corner, right? So when they have to cut a million dollars, there are places to cut. We don't have anything extra in our budget to cut. We don't. I mean, these renewals and, and, and retirements, okay, but 20 staff, when we're looking at class sizes, like, it, 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 no one has asked the question, why do we need this? No one has asked that question. We had the data last week, it is working. What we are doing is working. We have not been irresponsible with what we have done. We have provided for what the students need. We received on the school committee a great email, but a very depressing email today from a Hanson resident. She started the email by saying that in her 18 years here, all she has seen is the town cut. Closing in the McQuan School, moving the fifth grade, cutting foreign language. Nothing has been added. I feel like I'm bashing my head against the wall because three years ago we had these subcommittees and we're gonna get related arts and we're gonna get these things back. I mean, Jeff, you said I'm gonna cut a related art teacher and my comment was related arts, what related arts do we have? I wrote that. We don't have any to cut. Like, so I, I just think that that needs to be the conversation when we're going to the towns and we're saying we need this. We're not asking for you know, again, I'll use the AP Chinese, right? We're not asking for that. We're asking for basic services for our students and our staff that they need. 
And in that email that we received today, we learned that her two students do not attend Whitman Hanson schools because of the lack of opportunities. So that is two less students that we have. So we talk about lower enrollment. What's bringing kids here? Why are they coming? Why are they coming? We have to get our enrollment up for Chapter 70 and Hold Harmless, and we're cutting. Why are people going to come? Why? That, that, you know, like, those are questions that no one is asking. They just see the number. No, we can't do it. Enough said. And I just am very frustrated by that. Which do you see? And do any of you remember, not my stuffed up head again, the $800,000 at ends. So tomorrow, they're taking the Southeast Expressway out. And how are you all going to get to work? Just want to remind you. That would panic you. But you didn't think about the 800000 plus that we started without because it's gone. It's no longer a yearly thing. It's no longer something that supports our essentials. So that's what we're starting with. So you can get up and hold your BS through the microphone all you want. And I still love you all dearly because you live with me and whatever. But it's not, it, that's not what it is. Look at, look at what it actually is. You start at $800,000 down. We haven't mentioned that for three meetings. Oh, maybe we need a, a, a neon sign. We're not going to buy one. We're going to use cardboard <laughs> and crayons. <laughs> but you know, that's what it is. Here, I'll give you a highlight. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Thank you. Um, shall I? I will. Um, as I had stated before, that I, oh, and Glenn, yeah, let Sean speak first, and then I will get back to you. Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for allowing, allowing me to speak. Uh, Three minutes. I think if I had to frame the budget, I think I would I'd stop by framing it this way, you know, to help with some trends. You know, and David, that was a passionate, you know, passionate remarks, and definitely I felt that. Um, if we look at the last 10 years or so, enrollment has been dropping, which really has been the impetus to thrust us into this hold harmless situation. Mm -hmm. That situation has had a number of effects on us, I think, both in Whitman and in Hanson. In Whitman specifically, we would look at things like excess levy capacity and say, are we doing this properly and, and what can we do to improve? You know, so towns have been scratching their head thinking, how can we get more efficient? And obviously you guys have too. We could go through a laundry list of things where you know, we systematically have identified ways in which we can become more efficient in both the district and the towns. So that, that hold harmless trend has really driven us to this really high, to be really highly efficient. I think that's one thing that people should know that both in Whitman and Hanson and in, in the district, we've gone to great lengths to make sure that we're spending the dollar, like everything out of the dollar that we have. Also, when you look at that hold harmless situation and the drop in enrollment, there are benefits that the, the district has reaped from that. Weird side benefits of like the, the student teacher ratio. Mm -hmm. That is much better now than it was mm -hmm. when we sat in this room with Dr. McEwen with the Phoenix Project and whatnot. The, the student teacher enrollment at that time was terrible and now it's much, much better. You know, it's a weird side effect of that mm -hmm. hold harmless situation. You also gave a presentation where there was a, some, some things that have been added over the last couple of years that you're proud of, and I think you should be proud of. So I think what you guys are also mentioning is the other side of the list where the, la the laundry list of things that you want to add. So I think the question before us now is how do we keep moving forward? How do we, how do we keep kind of slowly moving forward so that we, we are at this point where we're super efficient and we want to keep going forward. We can't get everything on the list all at once, but five, 10 years from now, how do we systematically keep chicken, checking those things off the, the box so that in time, we're systematically making those gains? And I think that's, that's kind of how I would frame them. Today, as we sit, I do think the override, the reason the override is so difficult for the towns, or I guess I, this is my personal opinion, um, it's because we're still in the, old, in the whole timeless situation, although that might end. If that, if that was to end next year, which it may, you know, mm -hmm. student trends have been stabilizing. If it was to stabilize next year or the year after, the whole conversation shifts. Everything that we're talking about right now changes and we're now in more of a growth mode. You know what I mean? 
but we're at the critical point after 10 or 11 years where we pulled everything with bare bones, all three of us, and we're super efficient. So we don't have any place else to go. You know, we're really at a critical point where it's kind of a breaking point. I don't want to be dramatic, but it feels to me kind of like a breaking point. So I think the best thing we can do is get on the same page and move forward together so that we can get past this in a way that the community will accept. Okay. Highlight the positive things that we've done, the efficiencies that we we have, and then a path mm -hmm. forward that we can we can embrace no, no, together. Please, next. Go ahead, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair. You got Glenn first. Uh, let him go ahead, Fred. Or Mr. Kane. Sean, Fred has a question for you. Uh, through the chair, you had mentioned a number earlier of new growth. And I just want to make sure you know, I remember correctly. You said 1.2 million? No. Our new growth, usually we. That's we that's 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 Justin that's mentioned that. Are we familiar with new growth? Justin mentioned Justin it. Justin said 1.2 million. It's okay. The, yeah. Yeah. New, new revenue. revenue. So that's new revenue. <laughs> Two and a half, prop two and a half plus new growth is projected about one point two million. Our new growth for next year is looking around two hundred, maybe two hundred fifty thousand. Um, we had a big year last year. We we're expecting to drop off this just for purpose. But for, for FY twenty five, for FY twenty five, our principal assessor is telling us to project between two hundred and two hundred fifty thousand for new growth. For new growth for new growth. So even all of the new growth plus the two and a half percent, the district can get on top of their 18, 17 something million last year. It's not a lot of money. So revenue issue from the towns as well. Yes. You only have so much money as well. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Glenn? I just okay. want to clarify. Okay. Uh, I hear everything you guys are saying, Don. I hear what you're saying about classroom sizes. Hillary, I hear what you're saying about you know what we don't have, what we should have, and what other towns do have. And Dave, I love your passion, you know, and I love that you care so much about the kids. But we weren't elected only by the parents of students. We were elected by the elderly couples on fixed budget budgets. You know, we were elected by people trying to make their mortgage. So. What we're here to do tonight, I guess, is to push this thing forward. So, because we have to, we have to go forward. And I personally, I would love to say level services, you know, with that, move it forward, and then it will go to where will it go from here? Town okay. meeting. Town so, meeting, and then that, then the t then the community will, will vote on that. Right. Yep. That's that, and it's their money. You know, we're we're like a poorly run business that, without an infusion of cash, we're going under. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's how the, I just hate how the whole thing gets run. It's like we play with other people's money because it, it just doesn't matter. It's not mine. So just to answer, and that's the frustration I think the committee has, and Fred, and everybody here, the state has infused us, and I know I agree with Don that the whole harmless piece, but the cash that we see is not coming. Is a hundred and ten thousand dollars. And if I ran a business and I expected some money, it wasn't coming. I'd find something else. So or so, I'd close. So <laughs> so our budget went up five percent, whatever. And, and it goes on the towns. And I, I, I'm the super. I feel for the towns because we got a point zero 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 one percent increase from the state. But the town has the right to make that decision, not us. Correct. But that's what I'm saying. So when you say poorly, run, you're counting on something. To protect the kids, I think we should stay at level services mm -hmm. and move it to the town and let them decide what happens from there. Because this all what we don't have, what we do have, these hypotheticals. None of us are going back in time to fix these things. You know, we showed up or we bought a broken business. And, you know, this is where we're at. Let's move forward, please. Thank you. That's it. Make it short and sweet. Sure. Okay. <laughs> well, I, 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 we do it every year. I always talk about partnership. I mentioned Bandit. I love you. I love you dearly. <laughs> we hire a superintendent, right? We hear it every year. We hire a superintendent. We the superintendent said two meetings in a row. What we need as a district, what we need is a level service budget. And I want to remind the committee, as Hillary mentioned before, thank you, Hillary, thank you for your remarks greatly. Um, Every year, we've seen to lower the assessment, right? Mm -hmm. You can always lower it, but once you lower it, you can't raise it back up. Right. So man, remember that before you go and make a decision. I know we just lost two of them, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's not what we Yeah. Okay. May I uh, Well, we lost, sure. yeah, yeah. Steven. Steven. Yeah, Steven. It's, I, I don't, um, I'd like to see, the, it seems like the cause of this is the state. They created this. Yep. Mm -hmm. If we could get the towns somehow, the towns and the school committee, like we focus our attention, we have to get through where we are now. We have, but yes. it has to be focused towards 
the cause of the problem, and the cause of the problem was this, is the state. So if we can all have that one focus, to, it seems like when the state gives money, there's always strings attached. <laughs> yes. and, and, and it's a way of controlling, and that's the way I feel about certain mandates and things like that. So, But obviously, level services is, the, is a, again, you don't want to go backwards. We, we're seeing results. Mm -hmm. um, and again, there's a look at the finances. It's all, you have to take that realistic look too. Um, you know, in our community, there's, there's all, there's mixed. There's the, the homeowners, there's the people barely getting by. So we, we all have an understanding of that. But the, if, if our focus can be towards um, the cause, I don't know how, don't, you know, um, but it seems like more government involvement in pretty much anything, um, the taxpayer suffers. Yeah. Well, we did send the letters to our reps mm -hmm. and senators, you know, mm -hmm. explaining our situation, you know, because we have so many mandated uh, items that they don't reimburse. Mm -hmm. If they're mandated, they, if should mandated be, they, they should be uh, responsible give us the money. For and they don't. Um, right. It's even like when we became a region years ago, it was 100% transportation reimbursement. 100%. I don't know if we, on one hand I can count how many times it was ever 100%. It was never. I've heard that discussion. I think it was yeah. once. Uh, not, not. I, I thought it was maybe was once when it first started. Maybe, maybe years, years, years yeah, ago. Yeah, years ago in 93. But um, so, you know, if they gave us what they had when we signed up to be a region, the whole region, because the high school already was, that's what we signed up for, and right. they haven't come through. It was through. just that initial one time. In, well, in and the, I, even if they didn't, I don't even know if they did. I thought there was once that we did, but mm -hmm. I mean, they've gone up, you know, it's gone closer, you know, but then it goes, it's gone way down, like last year. Last year was yeah. our lowest. Yes, I think. But, well, it, we've we've had lowest. I we've mean, had we've had sixty four percent. Last year was seventy five transportation reimbursement, give or take. Yeah. You know, and this is we're budgeted for that this year. I mean, that could come back. I did uh, forward everyone. Don had mentioned the fighting the inflation gap. Mary Bork, our 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 co chair or co president of or co executive director of MASS, has gone to the legislature, and I forward you a response that I just got during this meeting, so you can see that. Because if they, if the, if Chapter 70 does adjust for inflation, this committee can always come back if we get more money and lower that assessment up to town meeting. I don't know, but I, I would say I'm not counting on that. You know, um, we've talked about in my superintendent's group asking not only for the cost of living or inflation, but looking for $100 a student. We got $30 a student this year, last year, and and and, and Steve, you you made the comment. You know, there's, there's always a string attached with the state money. So we, they moved it to $60 a student last year, and as Mr. Stanbrook was doing the money, uh, charter school tuition went up. Mm -hmm. So we got $30 a student, and, we lost and, and then charter school tuition went up that year. So it was like, you take your 30, and you take your 30, so we get it and spend it. And, spend it. and, and, and it never came to the district. Um, so the, the not saying it's a shell game, but it's kind of a, there's strings everywhere attached. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I would encourage a level service budget, as I said on February 7th. What February 7th, that's what we had. Mm -hmm. Let's Chris, try it. thank Let's you. Try it. Win, right? I, Chris, you ask, just real quickly, um, Steve, I couldn't agree with you more, um, but I think what you're going to find is getting anybody to jump on that train and, you know, hit the state house, it's going to be difficult. Right. Um, what kind of bothers me is when we have an opportunity to have Rep. Sullivan and Senator Brady here. I feel like it's more like a jovial, like, "Hey, how's it going? We're on the same team, right?" Like, if you remember when I asked them specifically, "What do you do to advocate for public education?" You could sense a little bit like, "Well, um, we do this and this and that." Like, that's, I think, what we got to do, is start putting pressure on our reps and, and not, you know, have it be nicey-nice. Because -nice. we're, we're in a predicament, and we see it every single year, and we need leadership 
to step up and not be so concerned about what the optics are, but to do what's right. I just recall that, um, that chart in the course and seeing the pie chart of the Chapter 70 money and just how much Worcester got. I know it's more populated, but not uh, it's the percentage as to, say, a, a, a town uh, something our size was minuscule compared to. But they're still to not getting all that they need. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry? Worcester, they're Brockton, still they're still not getting all still. that they need. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, uh, Stephen. I just want to report there's an actual band aid on the wall down the hall. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's gross in there right now, isn't it? Really? <laughs> okay. Oh, so, what I'm looking for at this point, um, we we're on. Oh. Can I just. What? Yeah. Yeah. Can I just ask a procedural question? Yes. Um, so, if we vote for the level serviced yes. budget and it's beyond what the towns have told us. Right. Because I think that that's an important part. We haven't, I, and I know you've had discussions, but again, there has not been a work together conversation. It's no, been, but that happened, this is that's what, what they were talking about after. Right, but it didn't happen last year either, right? It, it hasn't happened. It didn't happen last year. That was not a conversation. Um, it was not a work together conversation. Was this the one at the town hall? Yes. Yeah, um, and so, so what procedurally, what is that, what's that gonna look like? So we certify, well, you, we can certify what we want, and then we take part or not take part in a conversation with the towns. Okay. You know, and that's up so to that's us. So that's kind of where we would be. Yeah, you would. I would hope that we would have that conversation, but that's just me, and I hope it would be a conversation right. this year. Um, I think everybody's been pretty eloquent about why. We need the level service mm -hmm. and what's lacking, and I think everybody here has made their point. Um, so um, we do have. Uh, did did you want to have these pass out? No. Yeah, we could do that. Um, John, are, are you good with the level service number? Because I we have the. Uh, you want the papers? Just the way it is, right? Yes. Yeah. I have it. I have it here, but yeah, but. Do you want me? Yeah, you can pass it up if somebody. I don't have it. Um, Jen, Jen, can you give them to Jen the is going to give you the papers, and in parentheses, it's going to say what the level service number is at the bottom. Okay, so um, if that's what you're going to make, if that's the motion, or if it's a different number, I need to know that. Thank you. What is it on? Procedural question too yep. regarding E and D. Think in the past that has to be voted separately. Yes, it's mm -hmm. from uh, yes, it's, this. You'll see it's in there. Okay, because if I may have a quick comment about E and D and our balance again is seven hundred and sixty thousand. Um, is superintendent? Is there any opportunity in this budget for you to find the two hundred and fifty thousand in non-teaching? non-student affected cuts, I'm talking about supplies, Probably. other lines, because using E&D is extremely dangerous. Right, but for level services, we're not using E&D, right? Right, this is what If we're going by level service, we're not. If we're going by that, for the first line here cuts, cuts 900,000 right. I'm off. talking about a strict budget that we presented at opening day. Oh, you're so, talking about February 7th? Correct. Yeah. If okay. that's the level service budget, John has those numbers for you. Which I, I okay. think they're that's, on the page. And if you look, uh, if you just got a paper, um, yep. you'll see that that is, um, I'll put my glasses on here, uh, $63,590,845. That is the current budget amount. Is okay. that correct, John? Yes. Beth, can you say that out loud again? Yep. I'll let you know if it is. Yeah, <laughs> okay, like, thanks. Uh, I'm reading what you wrote. 63, it's 63590000 dollars Eight hundred forty-five. Yes, David. I move to certify the Whitman Hanson oh. Regional School District fiscal year 2025 budget in accordance with the PK through 12 Whitman Hanson Regional School District Agreement Section 4E2 in Mass General Law Chapter 71 Section 16B at sixty-three million five hundred and ninety thousand eight hundred and forty-five dollars. Second. Okay. I, we've had discussion, so um, let's take a vote on that amount and start there. All those in favor, 
of that amount, please raise your hand. Okay. Everybody? And again, against? Opposed? One. Okay. All right. So that's where we are. Okay, on uh, the next page you will see. Um, so, yes. I was going to make a motion to reconsider that vote. Okay. So, do, you want to explain what that if, motion to reconsider? Motion to reconsider is to do the same vote again to reaffirm it okay. so that it cannot be changed in the future. Second. Okay, so it can't be changed? That's my understanding of motion to reconsider. Yeah. But it can be adjusted. Can it be think. adjusted? Not if, after, if I, if I now going back to Robert's rules, and correct me if I'm wrong, John, if we vote to reconsider something that's already been voted, that can't be changed because it's been reconsidered. And I, I, and I can't quote me on that, but that's what I tend to remember, but I'm not sure. I'm looking on. That's town, town meeting. What's that? Right, on a different number, correct? Oh, okay, so. But on this, this is what we're certifying tonight. No. Okay, Fred? Should we discuss whether or not we're using any E&D funds first? Because no, wouldn't that change that number? Uh, well, apparently not. We're not because this is we the- We already voted. We are, this, what we just voted does not use any E&D. Mm -hmm. No, I realize. Yeah. Well, we can come back and always do the E&D. Not if we go with our reconsider. The no, if, you can make a motion if we come up with a new, a new number, a new amount, okay. we come up with a new number later. Uh, I'm not confident on that. If, I don't know if the rest of you are. Yeah. I, I, I don't. don't think I, and I'm we're not, voting the budget. I pretend to be an expert. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm not. But I don't. I hesitate to. Right. You can vote that down. It's, it, yeah. it needs a second. If it doesn't get a second, it doesn't move forward. So okay. we could always. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, it's the same. We could always review the legal. Yeah. We need to no, we don't have the time. Tonight. We don't have the time to do that. <coughs> okay, so we do have vote. Who would like to vote yes to to not reconsider? Okay, no, so this is the motion is yeah. to reconsider. The motion, the motion is, is to reconsider. reconsider. So yes vote, we reconsider. Yeah. Re yes vote, you reconsider. No vote, you I'm don't want to reconsider. So discuss. Which one? Hold on one second. Uh, which one allows us to change it? If we not say to no. reconsider. Don't reconsider. So if you vote no right now. It, it's permanent. No. No. If you if you, yes, yes, it's permanent. Okay. That, according to Dawn. Okay. And we're pause if it was permanent. I feel like I'm being tricked. Be our yeah, but no, uh, we have to go by that. Okay. okay, we have to go okay. by what we're saying tonight. No, okay. I'm just making sure. Right, I don't like, I don't like the idea that it can't be. Michelle has a question. Yes, Michelle. Something could change why between we now and that. Why we're going through this and get started? Because somebody requested it. Okay, what's the function? Because so that we can't change it and we can't do any meeting with them the towns or anything and we keep it the same okay all right so we have on a motion to reconsider and a second by David all those in favor of reconsidering raise your hands and opposed okay one four nine against okay so that means we could in the future reconsider so sure. before you, sure. get, you get to the assessment piece of it because that's the next piece we've affirmed the budget let me cor correct me if I'm wrong, John. To go to Fred's comment about E and D, the budget wouldn't change if we use E and D. The assessment would change if we use E and D. So you've affirmed a budget, and if you so choose to use E and D to lower the assessments, we can vote at any that point, at a separate yeah. time. You can do that at a separate time, which, which we right. have done like before. That. Which we have done. We have okay. done that. And you've also but, voted to, you know, potentially lower the budget and the assessments as we go. But right now you have a budget that was affirmed. Um, without use of E&D, without use of any external revenues other than what was presented to And you. it can't go up, but it can no, always go it can down. go down. Good. That would be great. <laughs> Sean? Just a clarifying question. Was, was that vote with the intention of um, an understanding that we, we need to go for an override and we'll talk about how to structure that? Or was it no? I, I don't think that was a... That wasn't of, part of it, wasn't, but that doesn't mean that speaking. I will have a conversation with the two town... Uh, administrators. Okay. Thank you. And about that, yes. 
Yes. Is it our business to ask for an override, or is that something that's no, town business? No, we have business? to. But we discuss. Can we recommend it? Or, like I don't we understand can talk where to we the, come into that. We can come into the discussion. Mm -hmm. We come into the discussion. If asked, not we can't butt ourselves into it. It's the nature of the partnership. <laughs> yeah. It's the partnership. I can't. Like to us into it. <laughs> what? No. No, I said they like to butt us into it, but we actually don't vote on over They do. That, that's my point. Yes, so but now we, it's all he would like no, because we yeah. have to still, have, you know, possibly have a meeting and discuss, and you know, or some of us or whatever. Have to or can. 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 Man, yes. uh, this the cooperation that we've gotten from the towns this yep. year, as opposed to previous years, yep. is remarkably different. I'm all for cooperation. Right. So I just I think it's in that spirit. Yep. that we're saying this is what we're voting on yeah. and we plan to talk to the towns and, you know, yep. in, the, in the future about what, sure. what that might look like yep. in terms of an override. I mean, I think an override is going to happen no matter what. Okay, so yeah. on the next page is the debt assessment first, okay? So this is the debt from the high school and... John. John. High school Explain debt. High school debt and. Yep. For uh, Hanson, it is the high school debt and also the H back debt. Uh, okay, and for Whitman? For Whitman, it is the high school and for a projected uh, bond anticipation note uh, debt for the school building project. Okay. All right, so. I need a motion for um, four, and I'll let whoever motions can read the motion. So that's for Hanson debt assessment. Would somebody like to motion? I Dave? move to set the Whitman Hanson Regional School District fiscal year 2025 debt assessment for the town of Hanson in accordance with the PK through 12 Whitman Hanson Regional School District Agreement, Section 4E2, Mass General Law, Chapter 71, Section 16B, at $251,903. Second. Okay, any discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Okay, unanimous on the Whitman debt assessment. I move to set the Whitman Hanson Regional School District fiscal year 2025 debt assessment for the town of Whitman in accordance with the PK through 12 Whitman Hanson Regional School District Agreement, Section 4E2 and Mass General Law Chapter 71, Section 16B at $623,531. Second. Okay. All in favor? Okay, unanimous. We're going to pass over the E and D at this time because we do not need to. And we will go to the operating assessment. And these are the numbers on here. Okay. All right. David, you want to? Sure, go ahead. I move to set the fiscal year 2025 Whitman Hanson Regional School District operating assessment for the town of Hanson in accordance with the PK through 12 Whitman Hanson Regional School District Agreement, Section 4E2 and Mass General Law Chapter 71, Section 16B at $15,325,369. Second. Okay. All in favor? Okay, unanimous? No, no. no Fred. Oh, I'm sorry, Fred? No. No. Sorry. Okay, 9 1. I move to set the fiscal year 2025 Whitman Hanson Regional School District operating assessment for the town of Whitman in accordance with the PK through 12 Whitman Hanson Regional School District Agreement, Section 4E2 <coughs> and Mass General Law, Chapter 71, Section 16B at $19,695,553. Second. Okay, all in favor? Opposed? 9-1. Okay. Nope. Okay, so. That's it, public comment if there's any. Yeah. Any public? You're all done, John, right? We did everything we need to do legally? Okay. okay. Any public comment? None, okay. Um, when, so, do we, when do we need to get them for well, uh, oh, <laughs> Hang on, let me get the calendar. Just to wait, a minute, sure. wait a minute. I'm, I'm yep. looking right now. It's April. I keep forgetting the date. April 10th is our next scheduled meeting. Our yeah, next scheduled meeting, but I'll probably be hearing from yep. the two town administrators, and we will let you know April about having another meeting, meeting before the 10th. Okay. Okay. If need be. Um, yep. if need be. 
Okay. Thank you, folks. Um, excuse me, that would be okay. April 10th. Okay. It's a definite okay. meeting. Yeah. That's our regular school committee meeting. We okay. Have, yeah. But if we meet with the two town um, administrators, the select boards, that would be a different one. I might be a text. Okay. That's all right. I'll let you do it. Yep. You can call. Motion to adjourn. Call in. Call in. Call in. They got phones and texts. In favor? From Austin, Texas. Thank you, folks. Unanimous. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I didn't say Austin.